Hi, I'm Diana Mont for the world's first trans. Yes, you hear that music? I hear it. The world's first transgender television journalist, born male, became female, and the rest is, as they say, history. Speaking of history, we have an historical figure with us right now, <laughs> Ms. Mariah Lopez, who is a transgender activist. She, I have known her since <laughs> she was 16, I believe. 15. 15. Uh, she is, well, I'm going to let you tell uh, them what you are. <laughs> tell them. Um, so I am trans. Wh where is it? Which camera? Um, the red light. Um, so, okay. Well, uh, just talk. Just never so, mind the camera. Um, I am an activist born and raised in New York City. Um, I began my activism sort of out of necessity after my mom died of AIDS, I was left to be raised by my grandmother who got, who was ill and couldn't take care of me. I was put into the New York City foster care system, which at the time had absolutely no beds for GOBTQ youth. Well, there were 25 only, but there certainly wasn't an acknowledgement of the entire spectrum of needs for queer kids. How old were you when you went into foster care? Um, nine or ten. And I was forced to run away from an abusive placement at 13. And 13 is sort of the number or the age where I was forced not only into activism, but social justice work around changing law and policy. When I was 13, lawyers from the Urban Justice Center and Paul Weiss, Rick Van Wharton, and Garrison brought a landmark case against the city of New York for all queer kids. That case revolutionarily changed ACS night and day. It went from 25 beds for gay and trans, gay boys and trans girls at the Green Chimneys Gramercy residence, so only 25 beds in all of East Coast foster care, to uh, millions and millions of dollars in a budget and hundreds of beds being open for all types of kids, lesbians, uh, younger queer kids where there were no beds for. Yeah. The city didn't even acknowledge at the time that there were queer and trans kids under 16. So uh, that first case was revolutionary in the way it changed ACS. Now, didn't you, uh, can I have my close up please? Didn't you, um, uh, fix the law so that uh, it was a second lawsuit uh, that transgender young people could wear. Well, not even just young people. So in a second case that I brought b uh, against the city called Joel A. V. Giuliani, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Jean Doe V. Bell. Yes. Um, J. E. A. N. Doe V. Bell. We sued under an Article Seventy Eight proceeding which is a challenge of an administrative decision by a governmental agency. And the city of New York, ACS, had said that I wasn't allowed to wear clothing that wasn't women's consistent. Clothing, yeah, women's clothing, because you were clothing. born male. Yes. Exactly. And so the, the reason it, it went beyond young people is because for the first time, New York Supreme Court ruled that gender identity disorder, being trans under treatment, fell under the auspices of being disabled under New York state law. And exceptions were, were mandated under the law that, that made it so what they did were illegal. So when you have exceptions under the law for a protected group, race, color, creed, disability, certain things become illegal. And so the limitations on my medical treatment became illegal. And so that did change the law, so to speak, so that trans people across the state could cite the case as uh, precedent. precedent when they were trying to fight for treatment and medical coverage for other stuff. Right, and in today's world, um, I believe that uh, transgender medical care is provided by the government, isn't it? Including, yeah. should one wish it, sex change operations, or rather, sex affirmation. Surgery. Uh, surgery, yes. That was, that was uh, after a third case that, my, uh, that I brought with the help of attorneys uh, Lopez v. Mattingly. And in that case, we challenged the city's refusal to cover the medical treatment that was sex change operation at the time. The city relied on an outdated, antiquated Medicaid policy and reasoning that said that sex change operations were experimental, 
whatever the reasoning was, right. ACS, a lower court, a lower agency, relied on a federal agency's decision that was outdated as for their rationale. When, when we won in my case, not only did it make it so that young people in ACS were able to now get surgery, it made it so it shattered the Medicaid uh, precedent or decision around not covering it. And so now Medicaid was forced, I think, through a lawsuit after, but because of my case, Medicaid now covers sex reassignment and facial feminization and top surgery. This is really important because overall, it's, it's, it's sort of funny when we joke about our new president-elect Trump. Oh. Please. But 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 the ironic part is you'll laugh here, right? Well, I'll meet that. Yes. You'll laugh. Sort of most trans people I know, if you left them alone and they were able to transition whether they were poor or rich right. and go to school, we sort of have semi quasi Republican principles as trans people. We want you to leave us alone and mind your business. Yes. So we sort yes. of like small government. Yes. We are all for paying our fair share of taxes and contributing Assuming when we can. Assuming we can earn any money. Yes. Be, yes, yes, exactly. We love to make money. And when we make said money, we don't mind paying our taxes. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I think <laughs> you won't hit you. I haven't heard a lot of trans We're big people. into the gender binary. <laughs> binary. And, and also, we're Second Amendment folks, too. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know a trans person that wouldn't like her firearm or pistola to be able to protect herself. J jokes aside, I think that what conservative people that, that, that may be considering rolling back trans rights need to consider, you leave us alone and you allow trans people to be the people they are, we're no threat to the American society that they hold dear. Yes. And if anything, we contribute. Yes. Be no fool that I think conservative and the conservative right and the Christian right they hold certain principles dear to them. And trans people are some of the toughest, mm -hmm. most resilient, community-oriented, family-oriented people we know. Mm -hmm. So we share a lot of values in <coughs> common with the conservatives. And I don't want to sort of beat their drum too much. But at the end of the day, we do need to not live in a world where we don't acknowledge the potential for rollbacks for trans yeah. stuff. The other thing is that trans people are not seeming to pay attention to the potential picks the Republicans, uh, the Republican elect makes for the Supreme Court. The irony and sort of bittersweet to this is trans stuff is just starting to take off. And there are cases working their way through the lower circuit courts that could have been mm -hmm. uh, some of the first co trans cases to reach the Supreme Court that we needed. What would be a nightmare is for the first cases that reach the Supreme Court to be cases that are decided badly. Yes, but we don't know for sure because even yeah. Republicans have trans friends or oh, relatives. Of or and whatever. and Donald Trump was, was the only Republican candidate to come out in favor of allowing trans people to use whatever bathrooms they, they'd like. Look, I was raised down the street from here, across the street from We're what on, was- We're uh, on West 59th On street. the Upper West Side across from where Trump Towers is. I, I mean, I, I grew up in a Trump New York. I'm as New Yorker as Trump is. I um He likes winners. I, I doubt Donald Trump will ever see this interview. But as a winner, as a, the consummate New Yorker, and as someone that sort of believes in a lot of the same things that he believes, as a millennial, I want to fight ISIS. I want to, uh, I want to fix universal health care or uh, health care across the nation so it works for everyone. What we don't need, again, is our rollbacks. And we, what we would appreciate as the GOBT community in general, I believe, is sort of just leave us alone yeah. and, uh, and focus on the bigger issues. There are bigger issues that I believe from the Rust Belt to here in the village of New York City that people can agree with. It's not the sophisticated Republicans like Trump who dislike us. It is the... Evangelicals who, you know, are very fire and brimstone and choose to dislike us. And, you know, I spoke with uh, Mayor de Blasio on the radio recently on the Brian Lehrer show. And I asked him, this was like two, three days after Trump won. I was heart sick, obviously. I said, you know, can this man roll back trans rights? And he said, Mayor de Blasio said, Diana, don't worry. 
New York is in effect a city state. Much of our law is home rule and people in New York will be to a degree protected from any national law that would inspire discrimination. Yeah, I'm the, I'm, as, the, as the executive director of America's first and oldest trans rights group. Which would be STAR, S-T-A-R-R, which stands for? Well, it now stands for the Strategic Transgender Alliance for Radical Reform, but it once stood for the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionary. I believe it was founded in 1971. By Sylvia by Rivera. By Sylvia Rivera. I like to say at 60, uh, during Stonewall, its inception, just by virtue of what sure, was happening. Uh, was but 71 is when it was born. When it was, yeah, but she, before that, was known for, I lived in the neighborhood. I went to school half a block from the Stonewall. I was 13 when it happened. But Sylvia Rivera was known even then as someone who protected street youth. Mm -hmm. I was not street youth. I was a little Catholic school mm -hmm. queer, but close enough. I mean, yeah. I used to see her around and, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And so, and so now, um, after Sylvia died, I was, I was very young when Sylvia passed away. In 2000. Yes. Diana, you're one of the only people that can remember Sunday brunches with both, w with you, myself, yes. Melissa Sklar, yes. Chelsea Goodwin, Rusty yes. May Moore. Yes. It's hard to relay the level of mentorship that was bestowed upon me by your generation and sort of how that carry over to my work. And so when Sylvia passed away, I, I was too young to effectively restart Star. And so I waited a while. A couple of years back, the opportunity arose to not only restart Star, but to take on the focus of cold case trans murders. Uh, the the co-founder of Star was Marsha P. Johnson, and her murder was closed or the murder investigation, she died in, in 1992. Yes, if Marsha P. Johnson was found floating in the river and no one is sure if she was murdered, if she simply fell into it uh, in a moment of fatigue or whatever, uh, no one is sure what happened to Marsha P. Johnson. Well, I got her, the murder investigation reopened with contacts at the, district, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and one by one, starting with Marsha's case, have been able to get uh, New York City officials and officials across the country to reinvestigate or to sort of prioritize cold case trans cases um, as a way of deterring current violence. Where m myself and other activists on the front lines disagree in how to reduce trans murder is that I believe that just like the rest of society, the law is meant to work a certain way. And trans people, although it feels like we're under attack, we aren't really, there aren't, you know, there aren't groups of people like the Ku Klux Klan looking to kill us on a right, daily basis. Right, right, right. The way you deter the type of violence that leads to the murders that we're seeing is the good old fashioned criminal just, justice system working. So I have a hashtag out that I'd love people to share. It sort of is long, but it's, it, you know, it's not as generic as trans lives what matter. Is it? Solve trans murder, save trans lives. So two different hashtags. When you, if a case like Marsha or Venus Extravaganza or Lorena yes. Escalera, all of these cases, Ali Forney, I've got Ali Forney's case reopened. Wonderful, but he wasn't trans. He was. A she was man. a trans person. Was she really? Yes. And so, a trans, gender variant, gender queer, drag, it all. This person was murdered and the same type of person. This is, this is what's key, actually. I'm glad you brought that up. So part of the reason these cases backlog and they are not solved is that the nuances around us, when I mean us as trans women, gender queer, gay men, the, the people, LGBTQ community. But the nuances of us and who would want to have sex with us and the wins and wheres and how Ali Forney might have ended up where they were, there aren't a lot of community members dealing with the police. And I won't lie, I've, I'm from the rough and tough streets of New York like everyone else. And having the experience in the illicit criminal element to my life adds a layer of expertise I'm able to offer law enforcement. And so she wasn't transgender, but it's very likely that possibly, or more than likely, someone engaged in sex work or drug use with Allie right. or Lush as she went by murdered her. And in order to, uh, being able to... Why would someone murder Ali Forney? Well, well those, those, so that's where I, I ended, and it's another good point for, not end it, but that's where I sort of end my specific advice in speculation. One of the key things that I was able to relate to law enforcement, and, and a big shout out uh, to 
Detective Wendell Strafford of the Cold Case Squad in the NYPD. Um, Detective Strafford is a heterosexual African-American man with no skin in the game, so to right. speak, to look for, you know, to specifically um, hold closed trans cases. But Detective Strafford has been a steadfast ally and just wants bad people off the street and wants to get murderers and sort of this is what we need. But to go back to where I sort of retract or end my advice to law enforcement, one of the things I told Detective Strafford in a case that we were discussing is that you may, you may end up finding the killer and information surrounding it before you understand why. So if you ever get stuck on why a murder might have happened, mm -hmm. I've been in instances in both drug dens and after hours on street corners and in people's houses where rage, anger, misunderstanding, drug-fueled misunderstandings can lead to violent instances in, in matters of seconds. So our life and our complicated lives as trans people and all these nuances from sex work to kiki girlfriends and gay families and boyfriends, girlfriends, tricks, tranny chasers. What is a kiki girlfriend? Uh, you know, a friend, a close associate. The point is, there are so many layers to our social lives that I don't believe law enforcement should necessarily get stuck on the whys. If they get to a, of the W-H-Y, I don't think... Right. They, they should always get stuck on why something happened because they will never figure that out. And in the instant case I'm referring to, I believe the detectives have ha, are, are close to making arrests in, in a case, and I believe they got there not by trying to figure out the why, but by taking what my advice. What case is that? I'm not allowed to speak about it. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, um, do you see hope for the trans community as we march along and make gains, do you think we'll continue to make gains? So I do. One of the things that are on the Trans Day of Remembrance, what one of the, um, so I, I, I issued a statement online and there were three main principles or, or objectives that I think the trans community needs to focus on going forward. So recently uh, on the Trans Day of Remembrance, I issued a, a statement with three bullet principles or points on what I think the trans community nationally. Excuse me. Can we please know when the eight minutes are up? Because we have no clock. Okay, I got it. I see. So, um, so I issued these three bullet points that I believe are guiding principles or goals for the trans community nationally. The first may seem a bit generic, but it is whether you're an old or young person, a uh, poor or rich trans person, we've made a lot of gains over the last 10 years. And the two things that we can do as individuals is live well. So there are advances yes, of in course, healthcare. living well is the best revenge. And, and, but, but literally, surviving and thriving is a principal objective of advancing our social justice work. If we're not thriving and, and, and um, powerful within our numbers, then what are we? But also encouraging people. So go get a job, go to school, open a business, get a sex change, get facial fem, take hormones, drink water, whatever it is. Or if you have bolder plans and you're one of the more seasoned vets, run for office, begin to really stretch our legs as a political block. I don't ever think our numbers as trans people will reflect in a significant voting block. But if organized, Every trans person has at least a solid core of five or six loved ones. And those loved ones have a solid core of people who respect and love them. Trans people can influence elections in especially places like the South where voting uh, suppression is heavily underway. Yes. I believe the networks and the communication structures that are already existing within trans and pageant uh, trans communities like the pageant scene like ballroom if we utilize those networks mm -hmm. when young leaders emerge to run for office or our allies do or we mobilize our allies we can become a political force uh the second uh, uh more important goal um I, that no one is really speaking about is a goal around guaranteeing trans reproductive health when the breakthroughs are available. Well, reproductive health? So yes. So, so Trans reproductive health? So yes. So yes. But we don't have children. So 
the the breakthroughs are only several years you away. You mean you think someday we'll be able to give birth? I don't think I know. How do you know? I don't know when you've done your most recent research, but there are women already giving birth that were not born with u uteruses. How do they do that? Uterine transplants out of Ohio. There's a there are clinics across the world. The, see, this is the problem, and not you per se. You know, I love you to death, but no one is, are having these conversations yet. And what will happen is, if we wait for the actual huge advances to occur, there will be an uphill battle based on the attention to the science and the ethics around it. Right now, all my documents say female, and I could. So do mine, yeah. I could, if my insurance provided it or covered it, get a uterine transplant and have a baby right now. All of this were covered. Our job as social justice activists, as legal act advocates, is to try to help poor people, not trans people, poor people, get Whose word numbers are rapidly growing. <laughs> yes. Get the Thanks wording. The economy. Get it, get the wording we need. Yes. So that when the time comes, it's not a trans issue. It's a human issue where the science supports people being able to have different reproductive rights. It should be my right. Yes. If if the and sh if the cost gets lowered to a point where it's comparable to other procedures and surgeries covered under public health or Medicaid yes. insurance that if in vitro fertilization or other techniques become cost effective, then if I wanna build my family, but my I have Blue Cross Blue Shield or Medicaid or any other private insurance, mm -hmm. I should be able to take advantage. Trans people, I think we shouldn't wait until the time comes when these breakthroughs are, are available to sort of seize the moment. Um, and yeah. Well, how can we not seize, I mean, if they're not available, you said we shouldn't wait until because because the, what we need right now are policy reforms and and laws that are not specific to trans reproduction and so no I agree because that would be very limiting and would be very easy to shoot down exactly whereas, but the broader if it's based argument on an like, economic like right system. now if if trans women ally themselves with 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 uh, pro choice I mean uh, um, um, pro life groups believe it or not even around the country pro life pro life. Oh, I see what you're saying because you would have a uterus and would give birth. I, I want to have a family just like yes. you guys. And how how much more pro-life are people that saying, you know, what this person wants to build and have a family? Yeah. At the end of the day, I, 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 I'll, I'll compare this to what happens in the Middle East. Most people may not know this, but Iran pays for sex reassignment surgery for its citizens. And obviously... That's because they hate homosexuals and they don't they want any, so... Yeah. So, so the but thing the problem is, though, is, Yeah, but the problem is, if you're a gay man who's a bodybuilder, oh, you can't be a bodybuilder. Okay, you have to go get yes, yes, chopped yes, off. Yes. 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 But, 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 but all jokes aside, I no, think there, there, are ways to there are ways to appeal to the conservative base to make non-issues just that to them, non-issues. I don't want to fight, excuse me, I don't want to fight later with Republicans or conservatives or insurance companies because the, pros the prospect of trans women having, or trans men having babies a different way is so dramatic to them that they can't stomach it. I'd like to lay the groundwork in terms of wording now that all American citizens, and, yeah. and I understand that with Trump in the White House, there's the potential for rollbacks in the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, which are essential. The, the Affordable Care Act itself is essential for any plan that I'm proposing. So we will have to wait and see Every if, other industrialized nation has free health care. Yes. We cannot say we're the greatest nation on earth yeah, and not have free health care, yeah. not have free uh, child children. leave. When men or women have children, they should yeah. be granted leave like any other country. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these outrageous uh, tuition loans that keep one in slavery for decades. No, sure. we are no longer the greatest democracy by any stretch of the imagination at all. Exactly. And we have to recoup our losses when it comes to personal freedom and have parity with other nations when it comes to social services. Mm -hmm. I mean, every other nation has better health care, better everything than we have. Mm -hmm. What happened? Right. Yeah. I, th I think what will happen, and, and this goes to my third principle that I laid out, and um, I can't ignore trans murder. I, I think we have to be intelligent, though, about how we approach preventing current or future acts of violence 
but you can't do this in a vacuum or a bubble. And trans people seem to do their activist work in this bubble where they think they can make special solutions. The way crime is dropped and or, or, or reduced in any community or segment is by the use of the criminal penal system as example and when it works. So people get locked up for doing bad things and other people see them getting locked up. And on that cheerful note, uh, I think we're out of time. Anyway, I'm Diana Montford. My guest has been transgender activist Mariah Lopez. Look her up on uh, the internet. She is an amazing and at her young age, yes, an historical figure. Anyway, I love you a lot. And even if no one else loves you, I love you. And I will see you next time. And I love you a lot. Bye. Ram. <laughs>